Hello, I'm Mario Guillén. I'm a professor at the Wharton School. Today is April 8th, 2020. And I'm having a conversation with Adam Grant, who's joining us from his home in Philadelphia. He's a professor at Wharton, as you know, superstar teacher, best-selling author. And of all of his books, I think the most relevant for this crisis is option B. Uh, so, Adam, could you tell us what are the two key takeaways from option B that I think uh, will be useful for this crisis? Yeah, Mario, it's, uh, it's wonderful, first of all, that you're doing this class. I love it. Uh, I also really enjoy your hair. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for making me feel at home. Yours looks uh, wonderful today, too. I've, you know, I, I worked really hard on it this morning. So uh, when, when Sheryl Sandberg and I wrote, wrote Option B, we were trying to figure out how individuals and groups and communities and organizations could build resilience. And I actually think one of the most powerful takeaways comes from our own Marty Seligman, a psychologist at Penn who found that the way we explain the negative events in our lives has a big impact on our, our resilience. And he talked about three Ps that came out in his research. I, I think two of them are especially relevant to this crisis. So the first one is a sense of permanence. It's very easy to get trapped in feeling like, you know, this is a terrible situation and it's always going to be terrible. And, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges of the coronavirus is we don't know when it will end and we don't really have clarity about how it's gonna end. And that can create this looming sense of permanence. And the, the advice from Marty's work is to say, look, just because we don't know when it will end doesn't mean it won't end. And it's a good moment to remind ourselves that nothing is permanent, right? This crisis will evaporate eventually. We will have a vaccine. We will have treatments. And some of life as we know it will be normal again. So that, that for me is the first takeaway. And then the second one is, the other P, I guess, that, that really fits in here is a sense of pervasiveness. When something goes wrong in our lives, we often feel like everything in our life is worse. It's like that pop song, everything is awesome, only everything is awful. And I think that's the first and last time I will ever sing in a Wharton or Penn class. But uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really easy to get stuck in this cycle of rumination where we feel like there's so many parts of our lives that are worse. And when that happens, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to recognize, well, not everything is worse, right? There are some things that are even better. I love the fact that I don't have to change out of pajamas most days, or at least pajama bottoms. Um, it's fantastic that I don't have to commute to work. I have now fewer awkward interactions with strangers than I used to. And I also seem to have fewer awkward interactions with people I actually know, present company excluded, of course. And so, you know, I think just realizing there's some things that are, are just as good, if not better, is a, is a helpful coping strategy. And then we're also supposed to imagine that things could be worse, right? We, we could be sick. Uh, the virus could be even more deadly than it currently is. I mean, there's a lot in your life that could be a lot worse, right? So that, that for me is where resilience starts. Okay. So you advise CEOs on a regular basis. Uh, what do you think in the context of this crisis is the best way of leading and nurturing employees? Well, I, I, the conversations I've had with, with a bunch of CEOs over the past few weeks are around, how do you find out what employees are actually experiencing right now? And I think in, in normal circumstances, that's actually a difficult thing to figure out, right? If, if you're leading a company with 1,000 or 100,000 people, you can't really sit down with each of them one-on-one -on -one and try to figure out what would motivate them and, and what their anxieties are. And even with your direct reports, let's say you have eight or 12 people reporting to you, it's a little bit uncomfortable after you've been working together for a year and a half to say, you know, I never really bothered to ask you what your favorite projects have been and what kinds of challenges you want to work on and what your biggest fears are. But, you know, I thought now that we know each other, we should probably have that conversation. I think one of the effects of this crisis is it's much more appropriate and even necessary to ask those conversations at scale. So I've been really intrigued by tools like Qualtrics Remote Pulse, where, they, where SAP has rolled out a, a standard set of questions to check in on what the employee experience is right now. And I, if I were a CEO, that's the first thing I would be doing to say, OK, what, what's working for you in working from home? How are you communicating effectively? What are, what are your biggest fears? And how can we address those? And then that's an opportunity to open up a dialogue about how to move the company forward in face of a crisis. Okay, thank you for your insights, Adam. So I just uh, read uh, a couple of days ago a paper that you just published in an academic journal. And the title of the paper was Procrastination and Creativity. So I, uh, I cannot resist the temptation of asking you, is uh, the research in this paper relevant to the current crisis? 
Oh, I hope so. <laughs> so this is research I've been talking about for a few years uh, that I did with a former doctoral student of ours, Jihei Shin. And we did find both uh, in using data from companies and in some controlled experiments that people who procrastinate somewhat are more creative than those who either dive into a task right away or people who put a task off till the last minute. Uh, but that's not always true. It's only true if you're intrinsically motivated by the task, you're excited to work on it, or there's a, a big or open-ended problem to, to be solved. And I do think that the, this crisis fits in that latter category, if not the former, right? This is, this is a problem that we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Uh, it's a category of problem that the world really hasn't seen for about a century, at least at this scale. And I think that it's possible that thinking about how to solve this problem uh, may benefit from procrastination. Now, let's be clear. I'm not suggesting, Mauro, that you should go <laughs> and deliberately procrastinate. I, th I think we all procrastinate enough as it is. What I am suggesting is most of us procrastinate from time to time. And instead of beating ourselves up for that, we can recognize that sometimes a delay has benefits as well as costs, right? Sometimes your first idea is not your best idea. Sometimes brilliant ideas come to those who wait. And I think there's a, there's a temptation around the pandemic right now to try to rush into the first vaccine that shows promise or to immediately implement measures that seem to flatten the curve. And I think we need to be really cautious in doing that. Um, and if not procrastinate, we, need, we at least need to be slow uh, and cautious around saying, okay, you know, the, the earliest solutions are not necessarily going to be the most productive or most effective solutions. And I guess that applies to our own lives too. I know that when this crisis started, I felt like I needed to be extra focused on being productive because a bunch of trips got canceled and I felt like there was extra work time to use. And the reality is we all have more distractions and interruptions than we did before. I think we, we've all become that BBC dad <laughs> whose kids are dancing into the, the video conference. And I think we need to accept that. I think we should lower the standard and the bar for what we expect to accomplish, recognize that we are gonna end up procrastinating from time to time and, and that's okay, we're only human. Okay, so you're one of the uh, most uh, beloved uh, professors at Wharton and many of your former students, I'm sure will be listening to this video. So what kind of advice, personal advice, uh, would you have for them? Well, I, I'm not sure that anyone should ever go to me for advice, right? I, I picked my career by saying, I have no idea what job I wanna do, so I'm just gonna study everyone else's jobs and <laughs> try to enjoy those vicariously. So take everything I say with a few grains of salt. I guess what, what I've been trying to figure out is, is what are our students grappling with right now? And so I've been in, in touch with a number of our undergrads as well as MBA students to, to find out what's on their minds. And I think one of the, the most consistent questions that's coming up is just how do I regulate my emotions? And I guess my advice on this one is to say the first thing that helps with emotion management is, is just naming what you're feeling. Uh, there's an experiment I love where people who are afraid of spiders were randomly assigned to just label their fear. And then over the next week, when a spider was put in the same room as them, they showed a weaker physiological stress response and they were more willing to approach a tarantula and actually walk up close to it. There's something about just naming your emotions that gives you some, if not power over them, at least a semblance of control over them, right? Once I know that I'm not just feeling shock and fear around the coronavirus, but I'm also feeling some grief, right? Around that loss of normalcy, I can begin to pinpoint the causes of it. And once I understand those causes, I can try to figure out which ones I have influence over and which ones I just need to begin to accept just like we would in the context of, you know, of a, a more, I guess, a more devastating personal loss. And I think that goes to the other tip that I would give, which is because of the uncertainty, it's really hard to, to fast forward to the future and imagine how things are going to go back to normal. I think instead, one of the things you can do is you can rewind to the past and say, look, you may not have experienced a hardship like this before, but you've experienced other hardships and you can probably learn lessons from reflecting on your own resilience. What was it that helped you bounce back or even bounce forward when you struggled with failure, rejection, disappointment, loss, illness? And I think the coping strategies that you tested out during those times are probably just as relevant today as they might've been before. Okay, so thank you so much, Adam, as always for your thoughtful uh, you know, pieces of, uh, of advice. Uh, so this was uh, Professor Adam Grant uh, from the Wharton School. Uh, author among several other best-selling books of uh, Option B. 
and uh, my fellow shiny head in the school. <laughs> Thank Mara, you so much for say, joining us. I just want to say thanks to you for putting together this course. I've heard from a whole bunch of students that it's been one of the rays of hope and light in this really difficult experience. And I've known for, I guess, over a decade since we first met that you were one of the biggest givers in Philadelphia. But I just think it's extraordinary that you're, you're treating this crisis as an opportunity for all of us to learn and get a little bit smarter. So thank you for that. And, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Ada. But I'm also learning a lot. And thank you again for your contribution and your time uh, here today.